This video is sponsored by Tone Gym. Being able to identify an interval by ear, being able to hear two different notes, and to know what the gap is between them, what the interval is between them, is an incredibly valuable skill as a musician. That was a perfect fifth, by the way. It makes you a better improviser, it makes you a better composer. But most of all, it means that you can hear a melody, whether it's on the radio or in your head, and know how to translate it onto your instrument. Without going beyond the octave, and staying within Western music of course, there are 12 different intervals, 12 different potential gaps between two given notes. And each of these intervals has names, like the perfect fifth, the minor third, the major seventh. So to be able to recognise those intervals just by hearing them, you could just listen to a bunch of them, you could listen to a bunch of minor thirds or perfect fifths, and try and get used to the way they sound. And that certainly does work, but something that can work really well in tandem with that, something that's slightly more musical, is to associate each of the 12 intervals with a famous example, with a famous melody that uses that interval. So for example, the perfect fifth, or the interval I played you a minute ago, a lot of people associate that interval with Star Wars, because the first two notes of the Star Wars main theme are a perfect fifth. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to give you at least one example for all 12 of these intervals. And I'm going to give you an extra interval, a 13th interval, one that goes beyond to the octave, because this particular one that we'll look at I think is particularly useful to know. So let's start with the smallest interval possible in Western music, the minor second, otherwise known as the semitone or half step. In some ways, this is one of the easier intervals to identify because the notes are so close to each other that you can't really imagine a smaller interval, particularly if you're a Western musician, you're not used to hearing anything smaller than that. So if it sounds like it couldn't get any smaller, it probably is a semitone. But the example, which is a classic example really, is the Jaws theme by John Williams. The bulk of that theme is literally pivoting back and forth between E and F. A semitone. So if you can hear something and the interval sounds the same as the Jaws theme, you know it's a semitone. Next is the major second, otherwise known as the tone or the whole step. And this is also not too hard to remember because it's the smallest gap you hear at the beginning of the major scale. So if you're really familiar with the sound of the major scale, the gap between the two first notes is a tone. So that can be useful. But of course we want a song, we want a melody. So still quite a basic melody, but Definitely valuable for this. Frere Jacques. First two notes. Frere. Major second. So if you can just think of the first two notes of Frere Jacques, that's your tone, your major second. The next interval is the minor third. So the minor third has a particularly minor sound to it, to me. Just in that one interval you get the sense of the minor key. So that's the example I'm going with today, Mad World. All around me are familiar faces. The first Two notes in the melody to Mad World are going up from F to A flat and back down again, a minor third. Our next interval is the major third. So I think the easiest way to identify the major third is think about the major chord. If you go through the notes of a major chord, this is B major, first two are a major third apart. And a song that literally starts by outlining a major chord is Stevie Wonder's Sir Duke. So those first two notes 
is a major third. Similar song that does a similar thing is um, Let's Dance by David Bowie. That also outlines a chord at the beginning. Um, and although it's not necessarily a major chord, it's a dominant chord, a dominant seven, the first two notes that we get in that chord are still a major third. So those first two notes, E flat and G, are a major third. The next interval is the perfect fourth. So my example for the perfect fourth is, well, let's see if you recognize it. So it's Summer Nights by Greece, well, from Greece. And the first two notes in that bass line, that's a perfect fourth. Summer loving had me a blast. The next interval is the tritone, sometimes referred to as the augmented fourth or the diminished fifth, all depending on context. And this interval is often considered to either be the most or one of the most dissonant intervals in Western music. It's got a real foreboding sound to it, that's C and F sharp. And um, it's often associated with the devil, where there's this um, now quite ex extensively disproven myth, thanks to Adam Neely, that this tritone was banned by the Catholic Church because it was associated with the devil. Now, that's not true, but you can definitely hear why that connotation would have existed, why that uh, myth came to be, because it has got that very unusual dark sound to it. So let's talk about a couple of examples. What about this? So YYZ by Rush is a great example of a tritone. That whole intro section is just vamping on that tritone. And another example, in quite a different style, So that opening tag from The Simpsons is going up a tritone for then resolving onto the fifth note of the scale. And you can hear as we move from the dissonant tritone to the very constant perfect fifth, that tension disappears. And that can be a very good thing to listen out for when you are trying to identify an interval if it sounds tense, if it sounds particularly dissonant, you could be dealing with tritone. Now, before we look at the next interval, I actually want to talk to you about today's sponsor because today it's actually something super relevant to what we're doing. Tone Gym is an ear training tool that musicians can use to improve their perception of intervals. Tone Gym basically makes ear training into a game. For example, their Departures game will play you an interval and then you have to guess what that interval is. When you get the answer right, you progress to different levels with more and more challenging intervals. Or if you wanted to improve rhythm instead, then you could play their rhythmic parrot game, where they play you a rhythm and then you have to tap it back. Improving your ear will do wonders for your musicianship, and Tone Gym is genuinely a great tool for improving your ear training. Use the link in the description to find out more about Tone Gym. Thanks very much. So that takes us on to the perfect fifth. And the perfect fifth, we've already talked about a bit at the beginning. It's the Star Wars interval. So those first two notes of Star Wars, B flat and F, are a perfect fifth. And the character of a perfect fifth is that it just sounds very at rest. It sounds very resolved and consonant. The only place really that sounds more at rest than a perfect fifth is the octave. And for that reason, sometimes people confuse a perfect fifth for an octave. So that's something to look out for. But Star Wars isn't the only John Williams theme to have that perfect fifth featuring so prominently at the beginning. So the first two notes of the E.T. theme are also a perfect fifth. 
The next interval is the minor sixth. So the minor sixth, a bit like the perfect fourth, can very much sound different depending on the context that you hear it in. If you were in uh, the minor key, for example, so we're in C minor, and I go up a minor sixth, it sounds like it wants to resolve, it has a tension to it. It sounds like it wants to resolve down. Well, that's just the context doing that. The interval with the minor sixth on its own in isolation is quite a pure sound. It sounds resolved. So in different contexts, it can have a different quality to it. It's not one of those intervals that sounds um, dissonant or consonant. It's sort of in the middle. So a great song that you can use for the minor sixth, and the reason that I'm on this slightly cheesy saxophone sound, The first two notes of the Baker Street sax line are a minor sixth. And another song, quite different song, that you can um, use as a reference point for the minor sixth is actually The Entertainer. The main melody from Scott Joplin's The Entertainer features this and that is a minor sixth. And as you can hear in this context, that sounds really resolved because it's the third and root note of the tonic chord. Can't really get more resolved than that, but it is that minor sixth again. So the next interval is the major sixth, and very much like the minor sixth, this interval doesn't particularly sound dissonant or consonant. It all kind of comes down to the context. So if I go between C and A, that's a major sixth, and on its own, at least in this context to me, it sounds like it wants to go down onto the fifth degree of the scale. And this is actually the context in which it's used um, in the song that I'm going to give you, which is the Christmas song, The Holly and the Ivy. So the gap between the first two pitches that the holly and the ivy is a major sixth. The holly and the ivy when they are both full grown. So next on the list is the minor seventh. And the minor seventh um, I've got two quite different examples for. So the minor seventh, for example, is the gap between E and D above it. And in this context. I think it sounds kind of like it wants to resolve somewhere. Um, and that's how it works in the melody which I'm going to show you, which is Leonard Bernstein's Somewhere from West Side Story. That first two notes in that melody are a minor seventh. But that's not the song which I grew up associating a minor seventh with. The song that I grew up listening to a minor seventh for is... Which is why I've run this stupid slap bass sound. So in that bass line, in, in Can't Stop by the Red Hot Chili Peppers, the first two notes in the bass line, E, D, are a minor seventh. And then you can hear it resolve to the octave. So the last interval before we reach the octave is the major seventh. The major seventh, particularly in isolation, is quite a dissonant sound. But as you may have found with all of these intervals today, once you get them into context, it doesn't always sound as dissonant as it might in isolation. So here I'm playing A going up to G sharp. So we're almost at the octave. And that's one of the things to listen out for with a major seventh. Does it sound like it almost is an octave? Does it sound like it wants to resolve onto the octave? <laughs> 
And that's actually what happens in the example that I'm going to give you, which is um, Take On Me by Aha. So the main chorus, um, the chorus melody begins with a very wide interval and that's why that melody that chorus is quite well known for being hard to sing because it's got right in the middle of it a major seventh and that takes us to the most consonant of intervals the most pleasing the octave so the octave is in some ways actually quite easy to detect because an octave two notes an octave apart sound like the same note just higher and lower. That's why we give them the same name. That's an A-flat, and this note an octave above is also an A-flat. Of course, it's still really good to have a song though. And the song I'm going to show you is really a very classic example of, um, of an octave. And that is... Somewhere Over the Rainbow. So I think that is almost the most foolproof song example you can have for that. It's right at the beginning of the song. It's quite dragged out. It's not, it's not a brief octave. That, that somewhere lasts long enough to really latch onto it. So that's the 12 intervals of Western music, the 12 intervals that fall within the octave and including the octave. But as I mentioned at the start, I also want to talk to you about one of the intervals that goes beyond the octave the minor ninth. Now, when we talk about intervals, we very rarely talk about the intervals that go beyond the octave, but it can be useful to know about them. And the minor ninth in particular, I think can be a valuable one to be able to identify. So why don't we talk about the intervals that go beyond the octave? Well, as far as I can see, there's two main reasons. The first reason is that they almost have the same quality as their equivalent within the octave. And what I mean by that is, imagine we have a major third, C and E. If I put that E an octave higher, it's no longer a major third. It's now actually a major tenth. But you've probably never heard of a tenth. And that's because both intervals have a very similar quality. They both sound very consonant, they both sound fairly at rest. So we kind of group them in as the same thing, we treat them as the same thing. After all, it is still C and E and C and E. They're very much the same thing from a certain point of view. The other reason I don't think we often talk about intervals that go beyond the octave is because intervals are about melody about listening to musical melodies. And melodies are usually sung by a human voice. And it's quite difficult to sing an interval that wide. It's not a very natural thing to do, not a very intuitive thing to do. It doesn't actually sound particularly melodic. So you don't really encounter that many melodies that use these wide intervals. I couldn't actually think of any examples for this video. So if you can think of some examples about major tenths or things that are wider than the octave, then let me know. But the one interval which I think can be valuable to know beyond the octave is the minor ninth. And that's not just because it's only a bit wider than the octave. And it's also not just because I have a good example, but I do have a good example. The reason is because I think that the minor ninth actually sounds kind of different than the minor second, which is its equivalent within the octave. So for example, if I have D and E flat, that's a minor second, a semitone. But if I put the E flat an octave higher, it still sounds tense, it still sounds dissonant like the minor second did. But I don't think it sounds as dissonant, it sounds a little bit less dissonant. It doesn't have that rub 
that you get when the two notes are literally next door to each other. And therefore I think that the minor second has a different sound than the minor ninth, even though they're both D and E flat, D and E flat. So that's why I think it's valuable to know. Now you're probably wondering, why am I on this weird keyboard sound? And that's because of the example that I want to show you for a minor ninth. Killing in the name of by Rage Against the Machine. That bass line is D going up beyond the octave to E flat, a minor ninth. So that is 13 intervals and songs that you can use to try and get the sound of that interval into your ears, into your head, so when you hear it in other contexts, you can pluck it out. And obviously there's plenty more songs you could have used for this purpose, and I'm sure the comments will be full of other great examples, so do check that out as well. And as always, a massive, massive thanks goes to everyone who supports me on Patreon, including the names you see on screen right now, and Andre Sainz Diarja, Andy Deacon, Andrew, Andrew Brown, Andrew Sussman, Austin Barrett, Austin Russell, Bob McKinstry, Boomer Dale, Whitney Parker, Cameron Allvilla, Colin Aiken, Chris Cabell, Christopher Ryan, David Bennett is hot, David Rivers, Donald Howard, Dr. Darren Wicks, Elena Skorchenko, Eugene Leroy, FD Hodor, Greg Kabofsky, Ilda Molotona, Hamish Brocklebank, Hernick Kutcher, Hugo Miller, Ivan Pang, Jake Fisher, James Ko, J.A. Hokensparger, John Dye, Josh Sanderlin, Justin Vigger, Mark Siegenhagen, Max O'Keefe, Melody Composer Squared, Melanie Schonert, Michael Vivian, Nancy Gillard, Nathan Lawrence, Nathaniel Park, Nick Chang, Paul Middleton, Paul Muller, Paul Hazel, Peter Dunphy, Richard Pride, Roger Clay, John Kennedy, Steve Daly, Stephen Lazaro, Tim Beaker, Homer Aharoni, Trisha Adams, Tim Payne, Victor Levy, Vidad Flowers, Vladimir Kodakov, Volti, Wayland Fairbanks, and Zappod.